1994, promoting American business in Dubai in 1999, building civilian provincial teams in Iraq in 2003, expanding our assistance to Yemen in 2004, negotiating the borders of Iraqi Kurdistan in 2008, and maintaining a vital security relationship with the Kingdom of Bahrain in 2011, a typical life of an American diplomat. Sometimes our policies contracted, uh, contradicted one another. Sometimes they were in conflict. Sometimes we failed. Sometimes we succeeded. But I was just one diplomat working a few issues one step at a time. And, and that's how I think diplomacy is done. Washington thinks the big thoughts, and the folks in the field, like me, go out and try to make it work. Since retirement, I've looked back at all those small steps that I took, and I've tried to stitch them into a larger picture, again, focused on the Middle East, where I spent most of my career, but also the greater world. So let me talk just a bit about American diplomacy writ large, where we are, how we got here, what we ought to do in the next few years. I'll keep my remarks brief to leave time to listen to your comments and try to answer questions and have a dialogue. First, full disclosure. As a diplomat, I adhered strictly to a nonpartisan worldview. I worked for Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, and Obama. A Democrat, Republican, Republican, Democrat, Republican, and Democrat. I retired in December 2015 before this new administration took office. I always voted, but I never campaigned for anyone. And I resisted attempts by various administration officials throughout my career to make me take sides. George W. Bush appointed me to my first ambassadorship to Yemen in 2004, and Barack Obama sent me to Bahrain in 2011. I was honored and humbled each time to be made ambassador. I truly believe that I adhered to that personal policy of nonpartisanship throughout my career, as did the great majority of my colleagues in the Foreign Service. It's essential to the conduct of American policy abroad, which has always been, or supposed to have been, bipartisan. It's not always easy. There are policies and decisions made in Washington that I thought were wrong-headed and likely to fail, but I always did my best. Despite the intensity and controversy surrounding some of these policies, and I would point to the decision to invade Iraq and overthrow its regime in 2003 as the most acute in my career, I never thought or believed that a policy was immoral or inhumane. I would have refused to participate. I would have resigned my commission. That said, I'm retired now and I have my druthers and I can speak them. I was raised by two liberal Democrats in Massachusetts during the Kennedy Johnson era. I marched against the Vietnam War. I was a conscientious objector to that war. I served two years of alternative service. My brother was killed in Vietnam. I have strong feelings about that war and all wars. And it's a big reason why I joined the Foreign Service. I wanted to serve my country. And I believed that diplomacy could prevent war. It's that simple. As a diplomat for 36 years, I lived in a multilateral, multifaceted, complicated, connected, chaotic, changing world. I strongly believed that the United States has been and must continue to be a leader in that world, a force for good. And I'm concerned today that our role has shrunk and our influence is waning and that the world is becoming a more dangerous place because of it and we are less secure. Now, I'm not a fuzzy thinking one-worlder. I recognize the limitations of the United Nations. It's an imperfect but in my view, necessary organization, the only one of its kind in all of history. I understand the vital importance of bilateral relations. It's what I worked on for most of my career. And I absolutely believe 
in supporting and defending American interests first and foremost as we conduct our relations with foreign countries. All diplomats, whatever their nationality, do the same, or they should, but we're in this world together, not alone. Since 1945 and the end of World War II, the world has been at peace, really. Perhaps the longest stretch of peace humankind has ever known. We've not had another world war. World Wars I and II engulfed nearly every country in the globe for five, six years each time. Millions of people perished, nations collapsed, cities were burned to the ground, innocents were slaughtered in a holocaust that knew no precedent and God help us will never be repeated. I can scarcely imagine the horror, destruction and misery of those wars. And since then, since 1945, largely because of American leadership and power, diplomatic, economic, military, financial, technological, scientific, commercial, cultural power, we have created a worldwide network of alliances, coalitions, international organizations, legal structures, communication systems that have been instrumental in preventing another world war. The great powers, US, the USSR, Russia, China, Europe, have not gone to war with each other. All of the smaller wars and police actions, military operations, or whatever we called them, these wars have stayed local within the border of a single country or a smaller region. The Arab-Israeli wars, Vietnam, Iran-Iraq of the 1980s, Yugoslavia, Iraq and Afghanistan in, the, in, in this century. None of these wars, as expensive and bloody as they have been, have approached the level of World War II. Now we succeeded in the creation of this relative peace because it was in the best interests of the American people to do so. That's really what America first means. The key to that success has been our ability and our willingness as a nation to cooperate with other nations, to seek common interests, to engage the world, not shun it, and to lead. America has become a more prosperous country, safer, more peaceful, and more fair and just. I know there's a lot to discuss here. Uh, there always is, but I absolutely believe that we're a better nation, a stronger and healthier nation today because of what we have done in the world since 1945. All of that can change and it can all go bad and maybe that's where we're heading. I'm worried. We've become more short-sighted. We're focused more on our immediate future. We're suspicious of one another. We're prone to disagreement and argument. We're allergic to compromise and petrified by bipartisanship and partnership. These have become dirty words in our politics and increasingly in our international relations. We have begun to withdraw from the world. We've abdicated some of our commitments and we've alienated some friends and allies, created adversaries from competitors and we're losing our ability to lead. I'm worried about the future. However short my mind might be as a 70 year old retiree, I care deeply about the world that I'm leaving to my children and to their children. And the challenges today are daunting. Unlike any, anything we have confronted in the recent past, they certainly were not on my agenda as a young diplomat in 1979 when the evil empire the Soviet Union was at the top of our foreign policy concerns. China was only beginning to awaken. Terrorism was restricted to extremist groups in Europe and the PLO hijackings. And global warming, nobody talked about global warming. Today, the biggest challenges to American peace and prosperity are not foreign militaries or economic competition. We can handle those. The nation will survive those. Today, we're faced with threats that are truly global and can only be confronted and overcome by global action. Action that we, 
Americans have an obligation and we have the wealth and the means and the ability to lead. Global warming and, my, and migration. I mean, the science is irrefutable to me. I think to everyone on global warming. The ice caps are melting, the sea is rising, temperatures are heating up, storms have grown more intense. Just ask the folks in Pensacola today. Drought is spreading, the climate is changing rapidly and dramatically, and we have no choice but to take action, and America has no choice but to lead. As we grapple with the causes of global warming and take action to mitigate them, we will have to deal with the mass migration of millions of people who are affected by climate changes. People who live in drought-stricken regions will move elsewhere. Local wars will be fought over scarcer resources, especially fresh water. Those whose homes have been devastated repeatedly by fire and flood and war will move. That's a simple fact of humanity's long history. Migration will increase, and we're better off dealing with it globally than nationally. War walls will not do the job. We cannot stop migration. We need to, to, to manage it. Pollution. Again, the science is irrefutable. We've poisoned our water and air. Eight billion homo sapiens have created a global ecological crisis that is only getting worse. And we can't just ship our waste off to some other poor country. We have to develop ways to recycle, store, reuse materials. Plastic waste is already unmanageable and an increasing threat to the health of the planet and its inhabitants. And one nation cannot do this alone. A global solution must be found and America must lead that effort. In health, well, we all, goes without saying. I don't have my mask on today because I'm alone in my room. But COVID-19 is not the first pandemic, and I fear it's not going to be the last. We haven't handled it well, but we're learning as a nation and as a world. There will be more. The barrier between animals and humans has broken down, and we can expect more viruses, more outbreaks. I do think we'll be better prepared the next time, but I absolutely believe that America should be leading a world effort to identify and control the next virus, to develop effective vaccines, to quarantine and shut down when necessary, to manage medical responses more efficiently. Global effort is absolutely necessary. Finally, in terrorism, the use of terror to make political noise will continue, unfortunately. We're at a relatively low ebb at the moment, the principal groups have been shut down or stifled, Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State. Terror has been around for centuries and has been the tactic of last resort for many political or religious groups. The recent news that the UAE and Bahrain have established full diplomatic relations with Israel is encouraging and positive in my view and overdue but I worry about the effect of those agreements on Palestinians who have been once again betrayed and abandoned, this time by their erstwhile allies in the Arab world. My first experience with international terror was PLO hijackings of airliners in the 1980s and the frequent horrible suicide attacks in Israel. They were not that long ago. Other oppressed and weak groups too might resort to terror attacks. The Uyghurs of China, the Tibetans, the Rohingyas of Myanmar, Kurds in Turkey. My last job in the State Department, as noted in bio, was as senior advisor on foreign fighters in, the, in our Bureau of Counterterrorism. I worked with the United Nations and international partners in Europe, the Middle East, to stem the flow of fighters from Europe, America, North Africa, and the Middle East into Iraq and Syria to fight for ISIS. We had some success, but it took a genuine international partnership spearheaded by the United Nations Security Council to achieve it. Again, my mantra tonight, a global solution. 
What do they have in common? What do all of these things have in common? It's obvious. All of these challenges can only be met if we work together. And to work together, we need diplomats, guys and gals like me, who are willing to learn the issues, the languages, the cultures, and take the risks that international diplomacy demands. We need diplomats expert in environmental issues, in fighting the spread of disease, in countering terrorism. We need economists, lawyers, doctors, soldiers, police, scientists, and teachers to become diplomats, to engage the world on global issues. We need a strong, vibrant, and flexible diplomatic platform. And that is the State Department to support and project our goals and interests. We need better leaders. The State Department is being gutted as I speak. Its budget is shrinking, its senior positions are going vacant and or being overly politicized. Its leadership is plainly lacking. Morale among the thousands of professionals at state, including in the Foreign Service, is at rock bottom. Last year, only 8,000 people took the written Foreign Service exam. For as long as I remember, we had more than 20,000 applicants annually for that exam. Dozens of experienced senior officers have left or have been forced out. And for the first time in my memory, mid-level career officers are leaving. Intake of new officers is at a bare minimum. We are slowly strangling our best and most effective diplomatic tool, and at a time when we will need it most. We need to rebuild and reinvigorate the Foreign Service, the State Department, and widen our diplomatic efforts to include all of government, the non-government organizations that work with us th throughout the world, and the private sector, business men and women, can be our most effective diplomats around the world. I've seen it in many of the places where I have worked. It's time for Congress to pass a new Foreign Service Act to restructure American diplomacy, to commit our nation to funding and supporting a diplomatic core that reflects our diverse nation and that has the tools and the expertise to do these tough jobs that I've described. We need friends and allies as we confront pandemics, climate change, pollution, other global issues. And, and as we continue to deal with longstanding bilateral challenges from China and Russia, we need an international coalition to deny rogue states like North Korea a place in the global community until they meet the bare minimum standards of humane behavior and global responsibility. We need the United Nations. We need NATO, the European Union, the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization, and the dozens of other international and regional organizations that will enable us to deal with these issues, that enable us to meet and organize frequently routinely. You know, we cannot go it alone. America first, which these days looks far too much like America only, could soon collapse into America last. And we can't let that happen. All right, I'll get off my high horse right now. I've enjoyed this opportunity to think about these issues again. I'm engaged with a couple of organizations that are looking at how we reshape our diplomatic efforts in the next years and decades. Uh, I'd be happy to hear your comments, try to answer your questions uh, and see, I don't know if you finished dessert yet or not, I'm looking around. Anyway, thank you. It's, it's been very good to uh, talk to you and I, I look forward to, uh, to, to hearing your comments.
Okay, I can't hear anybody. Try that. Okay. All right, can you hear me now? No? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, that was a yes? Yes, yes I can. Okay, great. Um, yes, thank goodness. I have um, one raised hand. Uh, Joanne Cummings, are you, are you, do you have a question or were you going to comment on the, on the tech here? Can unmute yourself, Joanne, if you have a question. Hmm. Okay, we can continue to go on. Um, any other questions from the audience? All right, be right there. I have a question that I've pondered about in ignorance for many years. The United States has a custom of having non-political appointees, or I mean very political appointees, to the major countries, England, France, Germany, and so on. How common is that practice in other countries? Or do they have career foreign service trained people as their senior ambassadors where we do not? Thank you, sir. That, this, this is a question that, and an issue that has been discussed throughout my entire career as we look at trying to uh, get the very best people that we can to represent the United States of America in those important jobs as ambassadors. Uh, we are, to my knowledge, the only country that appoints such a large percentage of political appointees uh, to the to ambassadorships around the world. Uh, some countries reserve that for the, uh, just a handful of countries. For example, um, uh, the, uh, the, I believe the current ambassador from the United Kingdom to Washington uh, is, a, is a, a political appointee. Uh, Washington is often the capital where someone very close to that uh, world leader may be appointed. There, there are a few others. There are a handful. It's rare. Frankly, most of my colleagues from uh, other foreign services, as we would sit around and, and discuss this issue, were, were, were amazed uh, that we have, uh, we have so many uh, appointees. In general, it's about 30% of our ambassadors are political appointees. Uh, working in the Middle East as I did, I did not work for many political appointees. It's not a place where, where most political appointees want to go. Um, so uh, as you said, they often go to uh, the European capitals and to the larger uh, capitals of the world like Tokyo, for example. Um, I have never worked for a political appointee. I have worked with many of them. And when I left my first ambassadorship in Yemen, I, uh, I, I was at the National Defense University for two years. And during that time, uh, I spent uh, uh, many weeks of the year working with political appointees who were going out to embassies uh, to be ambassadors, uh, mostly explaining to them what an embassy is, what it does, who works there, uh, how do you connect to Washington, so the practical day-to-day uh, -day work of an ambassador uh, running your embassy. In my experience, many of these people, many of these men and women were, were, in, were experienced, uh, uh, very dedicated individuals, um, and many of them did a good job. We have had many embarrassments as well. People unqualified, uh, people who were not really interested in the job, only in the title, uh, people who did a very poor job of running their embassies, uh, people who got the job, frankly, because they uh, uh, either donated or organized a basket of donations for the president. 
it's possibly the only government position of that rank, you know, that is still basically uh, a political uh, appointment uh, that the the president uh, uh, can give. Um, I frankly think, and I know one of the organizations, one of the groups that's looking at restructuring our diplomatic presence abroad and how we how we conduct our, our international affairs recommends that the maximum should be 10% of political appointees. Again, I've met some extraordinary people uh, who are political appointees, but I've also uh, bumped into a couple of duds and, and, and I think that perhaps uh, a 10% would be an ex would be a good figure. I, I don't hold with those who think every ambassador should be a, a foreign service officer. I have two um, two questions that <clears throat> seem to be related, so I will I will read them both to you and let you respond. Um, from Mr. Al Bittner has commented wonderful, powerful, wonderful commentary. Any thought about how we go about rebuilding American diplomacy? Um, along with that, we have an anonymous question um, from someone who says, I served in three different embassies as a military cooperation specialist and have the utmost respect for the amazing work that state and the foreign service officers do. Yes, it has been eviscerated. How long will it take to rebuild to where we were before the current administration began. Okay. First, there are a lot of ideas on how we, we should restructure the State Department, the Foreign Service, and all of the other government uh, uh, organizations that contribute to an embassy abroad, including the US uh, military. Uh, an embassy often comprises representatives from a dozen uh, American agencies. Uh, and is close, as I said, works closely with international organizations uh, uh, around the world. I think that the last time we had a congressional uh, uh, commission that rewrote the laws and regulations that structure the uh, State Department, Foreign Service, and diplomatic, our, our diplomatic efforts was in 1981, the Foreign Service Act of 1981. So that's almost 40 years ago. Uh, it's, it's obvious the world has changed a lot in 40 years. And as I said in my talk, we had the challenges that I think are, are foremost for our, uh, for our diplomats and for our, our, our international efforts are, are global in nature and will require a different kind of diplomat, a different kind of service uh, of State Department in order to confront them. Uh, it was very, the State Department is not just the Foreign Service, of course, there's a large civil service contingent. And as I just said, there are many, many other agencies have, uh, uh, have departments within them uh, that operate overseas. Uh, the Department of Agriculture, Department of Treasury, uh, Department of Justice, uh, to name a few. Uh, it can be very frustrating, particularly when you have a, a, a specific job that you want to do as the President of the United States or as, uh, uh, and, and you want to gather all of, the, all of the various tools that the United States government has. And it's very hard to coordinate among the agencies. It's even harder to bring in people from the outside on temporary uh, assignments, uh, give them temporary commissions in order to handle the effort. Whether there's something, for example, like uh, a very successful effort called PEPFARS, P-E-P-F-A-R-S. It was George Bush's uh, led program to fight AIDS in Africa. Uh, and it was a remarkably successful effort because they were able to bring in a lot of the private sector, the, nat the, the international government organizations, uh, USAID, uh, the uh, Center for Disease Control, uh, et cetera. That's, that should be easier. It should be easier for the president to, to gather the necessary expertise and deal with the issue at hand. And I think that's something the State Department should lead and the Congress should give the State Department 
or, or the authority to, to, to do that and the, the means to do that. Uh, I think that the traditional diplomatic skills, the ones that I, I grew up with and, and, and honed in my 36 years, language, culture, learning the, you know, the, the bilateral relationships, the issues, the sort of regional issues. Throughout my career, the regional departments of the State Department were by far the better funded and the better staffed. The so-called functional bureaus, the global bureaus, uh, were often take, given the back seat. I think that should change. I think that we should refocus our efforts on those global issues, strengthening those uh, bureaus within the State Department and within the government uh, uh, in whole uh, in, in order to focus on, on climate change, on international terrorism, on, on, on pollution, on health issues. Uh, we would be so much better off if we had a genuine international effort to find this vaccine that we're all waiting for. Certainly I'm waiting for. I'd much rather be sitting there eating with you tonight than sitting in my house in Falls Church. I'd rather be anywhere right now, as much as I love Falls Church, Virginia, and my house. But so, so I think it's, 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 it's essential that as soon as, as we, can, we can do it, and obviously in this political season, it's gonna take a while, but we need to establish a commission that looks directly at how we conduct our diplomacy, and we need some serious revisions. The second, uh, I don't know how long this will take. It'll take a while. It's gonna take a couple of years. Now we can, we, can, we can focus on a couple of the key issues immediately. We need to, we have to, and as a country, we've always been able to, so we should do do that, but a, 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 more, a more structured response is going to take a while. It's going to take a much larger budget. But I will say to my military friend out there who, who asked the question, uh, I have, uh, in my experience, particularly in the last 15 years of my career, I worked very closely with the military, mostly in Iraq, but also in Yemen and in, in Bahrain, where we have our largest Navy uh, base in the Middle East. And I think if you sat down 100 flag officers uh, throughout the US military and you asked them whether or not we should build a stronger, larger, more robust diplomatic corps, uh, 99 of them, maybe all 100 of them would say yes. Jim Mattis, who I had the pleasure and the honor of meeting and working with many times, is famous in the State Department anyway, for having said to a congressional panel, if you don't increase funding fund for the State Department, you better buy me more bullets because we're going to need them. Thank you. Um, I have a question from our board president, Carl Schneider. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for your service. Please look into your crystal ball. And if you could, please share your thoughts on a rising China and how might that all turn out in three to five years? Yeah, uh, when I, I mentioned in my talk when I first came in the Foreign Service, China was just kind of a blip on the horizon. It was a big blip, but it, but it, but it wasn't really a factor in most of our international policies. Uh, it was just coming out. And we have all, so throughout my career, even though I spent my career in the Middle East, mostly, the presence of China has become larger and larger and larger. I was always very impressed with the quality of Chinese diplomats at my level, the political officers and then the ambassadors whom I dealt with in places like Sana'a, Yemen, in Baghdad, in Bahrain, uh, in, in uh, uh, the UAE, uh, they had some top-notch people. It was clear that they were focusing on reaching out uh, to the greater world. And we've seen in the last 20 years an enormous expansion of Chinese influence uh, and Chinese power. Uh, we have, I think, rightly engaged China primarily in commercial matters 
Uh, we have uh, American companies have engaged in China in a way that I could never have imagined. Uh, we are closely entwined with China uh, in commercial and business matters. And I have always been a believer since my days in Dubai that business ties are strong ties. Uh, I would, in places like Yemen in 2004, and it's hard to imagine today considering the state of Yemen today, but in 2004, uh, uh, Yemen was relatively peaceful and we had an opportunity to actually increase our development efforts and our investment in Yemen. And I always believed that it was the business community, it was, it was international business, American companies, investment in Yemen that would provide us with the strongest links to that country and be the most effective means of economic development in the country. And I still believe that. So those, those business commercial, the commercial trade ties with China uh, are not going to go away easily. Uh, I hope they don't anyway. And I do think we can continue to build on those as we consider uh, the confrontation or the, uh, I, I, uh, the our, confr our, our increasing confrontation with China in other issues, including military, uh, security, and uh, uh, sort of the cultural human rights issues to come. Uh, we're not doing a particularly good job, and neither are the Chinese right now, in our diplomacy with each other. There's a lot of talking past one another. There's a lot of, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of drama and uh, exaggeration on both sides. Um, I'm concerned, but I also think that we have a strong relationship with them and we can exploit that relationship uh, without, uh, without uh, jeopardizing uh, our security. Uh, there are lines that should be drawn and carefully enunciated uh, by diplomats, by military leaders, by presidents. Um, but uh, I do think that uh, uh, our dealings with China will continue to dominate both regionally and bilaterally. I told young foreign service officers when I, when I was at the, at the university, I spoke with a lot of new foreign service officers. And I said, you know, in high school groups and, and university groups, I said, if you're looking at the next 20 years and you're thinking about what language should I learn if I'm gonna be in the foreign service, Chinese was my first. Learn to speak Chinese. I still, by the way, believe that language learning is extraordinarily important for diplomats. There should be a small core of diplomats who are fluent in these important world languages. It helps, even though English has dominated uh, throughout the world. But uh, China is, is going to continue to be, I think, our number one sort of bilateral uh, uh, foreign policy issue. Thank you. I have a question from Chloe Liebert, who is a high school student at Fountain Valley School. Chloe wants to know what, where was your most interesting field work? Well, thank you, Chloe, and, and good luck in high school. This must be a hard, hard year to be in high school, and I just want you to stick it out. And thank you for your interest in international affairs. Uh, I know that being in Colorado Springs, you have a greater link to the wider world through the Air Force Academy and other institutions and through this council. Uh, so, so I encourage you to continue uh, your interest and take a look at the Foreign Service at some point uh, in, in the future. Um, I think that, you know, the word interesting, if we're just talking about China, and I'm sure you've all heard the old cliche, that you know, the Chinese saying, may you lead an interesting life is not necessarily, may you lead a good and happy life. Um, I think that as far as interesting goes, it was undoubtedly the most challenging position that I had, and that's when I went to Iraq both times. Uh, as is, I think, well known, the State Department in 2003, led by Colin Powell uh, and Rich Armitage, was largely opposed to the growing, the growing pressure on the president uh, to use our military 
to overthrow Saddam Hussein. Uh, and, and those discussions, uh, and I was back in Washington, I was the de deputy director and then the director of the Iraq desk. Those, those discussions were among the most painful that I've ever had. And I was very glad to leave them and go out to Iraq to take on a job that I'd never thought I would take. I never thought I'd end up in Baghdad. I actually thought I was gonna end up in Tehran when I came back after Dubai in 2001. That's another story. But being in Iraq, recognizing that the president had made this decision, our military had done their usual brilliant job of, of, of taking down Saddam uh, very quickly. And now we were left with this country that frankly, we didn't know that well. We didn't have a lot of levers into various parts of the society. We hadn't had diplomatic or any real relationship with it for more than 12 years. They had been an implacable foe, an enemy even, uh, 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 during that time. Um, and we had a country that was traumatized, uh, that was broken, and that suddenly we were in charge of. I worked for Jerry Bremer and his staff, and my job was to try to bring in more diplomats, more civilians, to work with Iraqi, mostly political groups, but Iraqi civilians around the country as we try grappled with issues like constitutions and elections and government shape and it was it was it was incredibly engaging i mean i i i didn't have a whole lot of time for anything but working uh i would hesitate to say i loved it because it was increasingly dangerous i thought it was a really bad idea that we had done this but here we were trying to make it work i thought it was the kind of the, 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 the core of what a foreign service officer should do. I worked for a man named Ryan Crocker, uh, who was our ambassador in Iraq later on. He was ambassador in Lebanon, Afghanistan, Pakistan, one of the greatest diplomats of my generation. Uh, uh, and Ryan said, you may not like the policy, but you've got to get out there and do the job. If it's, if the policy is, if you are so opposed to the policy, you should quit. But we're foreign service officers. We signed an oath. We signed a contract. We're committed. Let's go do the job. And that was, that was kind of a thrilling. I, not my, not my favorite assignment, but certainly the most challenging and most interesting. Thank you. Uh, I have a question from Mr. Jeff Cooper. Could you please comment on what you believe the recent steps in Bahrain actually mean strategically for themselves? Ah, that's a really good question. I mean, I, 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 uh, I was not surprised, first of all. I was not surprised that Bahrain uh, agreed to establish full diplomatic relations with Israel. I was not surprised that the UAE had done it uh, a month ago. Uh, the countries of the Gulf were the first Arab countries, uh, along with Jordan in 1994, 95, when the Gaza-Jericho agreements, which I was reporting on out of Cairo, when these were signed and it was the beginning of the Palestinian administration. And it really looked as though we, we were gonna make a deal with Palestinians and Israelis it, like so many of those attempts, it eventually crumbled. But during that time, the Gulf countries, Oman, Qatar, the UAE, Bahrain, Kuwait, uh, all established uh, formal uh, uh, Israeli commercial offices, mostly, uh, staffed by Israeli diplomats, um, uh, again, focused on business and commerce. Almost all of those offices were closed in subsequent years because of events in the Middle East, uh, Israeli wars with Lebanon and Hezbollah, uh, the Intifada, uh, pressure from other Arab countries to do so. Uh, but some maintained, and I think most of them maintained some degree of communication and contact with Israel. When I was in Dubai in 1997, their office had been closed, but I was still 
surprised, a little shocked as I moved around town and it was mostly business there. So it was lots of receptions and business meetings and, and negotiations of contracts. I, I was often, I was shocked to find so many Israelis openly doing business in Dubai. Uh, they, off, they traveled on their Belgian passports or their American passports. Uh, but they were very candid about who they worked for, which companies they worked for, which country they lived in, and the Emiratis knew it and accepted it and wanted it. The same was true in Bahrain when I was there 2011, 2014. Uh, there were contacts. Uh, I think all, most of the Gulf countries have maintained that level of contact. When I would meet with leaders from uh, uh, Bahrain, the crown prince, is one of the most uh, articulate and, 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 and knowledgeable uh, leaders in the Middle East. Uh, he would sit with me informally, uh, I don't think I'm breaking any informal pact here, but, and say, why the hell don't you Americans make the Israelis make a deal with the Palestinians so that we out in the Gulf can get on with business? They were not particularly uh, attached to the Palestinian cause. They had to pay it necessary lip service. They were Arab countries after all. There was a great frustration with the Israelis, with us, and maybe especially with the Palestinians. Why don't you make a deal? And you got a sense over these last months and with the announcement of these deals that that sort of frustration finally peaked and they said, we're gonna make a deal. Um, I don't know what it's going to develop into. I don't know really how much real uh, benefit there will be in it. Um, I think that there's going to be some blowback in other Arab countries. Certainly everyone's watching to see what Saudi Arabia will do. Some of the analysts think that Saudi will be next. Saudi is a different different ball game entirely. They have a much larger Saudi population. Oil prices are depressed. Their budgets are in trouble. Uh, the Saudis have always paid off Saudis. Um, it, there's going to be blowback. And in Saudi Arabia, which is a much more conservative Muslim country as well, uh, it's not such a sure thing. Uh, that said, Bahrain would not have made this agreement without Saudi acquiescence. I also, I don't think UAE would have either, although the UAE is more independent and stronger than Bahrain is. So, and the benefit is also with us. Uh, these Gulf countries appear to like the current administration quite a bit. Uh, and they, they see it as being strong on Iran, which is their main foe and their main threat. All of them, you need only look at the map of the Persian Gulf to see how close Iran is and how easy it would be without the American Fifth Fleet in Bahrain for the Iranians to, uh, to exert much more influence, shall we say diplomatically, on these Gulf countries. So, so they see Iran as the big threat. Israel thinks the same. There's a confluence here. Uh, we'll see where it goes. In all, I think it's a good thing and I think it's long overdue. Thank you. I have a question from an anonymous attendee. It seems that many Americans have no idea of the need for our diplomatic efforts and embrace the isolationist ideas that are abundant now. How do we educate them about the need for our foreign service and diplomacy? Well, I'll turn the question right back on you. How do you educate them? It's because you, you are the folks in the community who who are engaged in international efforts. You are the folks who work with university students and high school students and the greater community to, to I assume, inform and persuade people that America's relationship with the world is really important to us, that isolationism is a thing of the past. It didn't work then, it's possibly worse now. We cannot wall ourselves off from the world. God, COVID-19 should have taught us that. Uh, we are part of this greater world for better or worse, and we should make it for better, and we can. I, 
you know, we try. We're we're small. The Foreign Service is tiny. You know, we're we're uh, the favorites to when I was head of assignments uh, in in the State Department, uh, and I spoke to a lot of different and, and at the National Defense University, I spoke to a lot of groups like yours, and around the country. And, and one of my talking points was there are fewer Foreign Service officers than there are members of military bands. Uh, we're a small group. We're not well known. Um, uh, and it's hard for us to, so, so our community in the United States is small, uh, our, whether it's families and towns, there aren't foreign service bases around the United States. I mean, the military has a great, has a great connection with the, 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 the American community. Nobody questions nobody. Man, we, we do question it, but we also agree to spending $14 billion to build a new aircraft carrier. But we, the Congress gives the military more money than they want some years. I had military officers banging their heads on the desk saying, why don't they redirect this money to USAID or to the State Department, Foreign Service, others who can make much better use of it than I can. I can only buy so many weapons. Uh, I don't know how we do it because we've been trying and trying. We're small. Diplomacy, you know, the, uh, Americans are well educated uh, and Americans care. Uh, everybody cares about their own community first, of course. Everybody cares about their own family, their own country, their own tribe. I mean, that's where it builds, builds from. So it's, it's, it's hard particularly when things are happening around the world that you don't think really matter to me here in Colorado Springs or in Falls Church, Virginia. Uh, and and it, it, it takes real leadership. It takes political leadership. I think that it would be very, very, very uh, helpful and effective if our political leaders in Washington, in Congress, and the Senate, uh, in the White House, the administration, all kind of stood up and say, hey, we need to do more uh, to build our diplomatic strength. Uh, that doesn't happen. It doesn't win votes. And there's an old shib of, there's an old saying that you don't, you know, foreign policy never wins an election. It can lose you an election if you've got, you're in a bad war, or you've really screwed up. But it never wins an election. It sure in heck doesn't win a congressional election. I mean, you're your representative from, from Colorado Springs probably doesn't raise a lot of international foreign policy issues when she's out there uh, campaigning. Uh, and that's the nature of things. I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I am worried that we're, we're, we're looking more inward now, that we're collapsing in on ourselves more now uh, than we have in the last 40 and 50 years. And that concerns me. Thank you. Uh, question from Bill. We have not had a world war since World War II. Is this due to the fear factor associated with the availability of nuclear weapons since then? Now, Bill, that's, that, that's a really interesting point. And I took that paragraph out of my talk because I thought I was going to go on too long. I, I could have put it in because certainly one of the factors uh, and one that I, as a 70-year-old, you know, in elementary and junior high school in the 1960s, uh, remember really vividly this intense fear that, that we had of a, of a nuclear war. And it certainly, certainly played a, a large part in preventing war between uh, the Soviet Union and the United States, primarily a mutually assured destruction. And it's a scary, scary, policy, but it worked. I just finished reading a fascinating book that I'm sure a lot of you have read. It's a little controversial, but in all, I found it, I found it enlightening. Sapiens by uh, uh, Yuri Hariri, Yuri Tuval Hariri, I think that's his name. Uh, it's basically a history of mankind, of homo sapiens. But he makes the point on this as he's looking at, at the modern world uh, and, and he actually proposed uh, uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, uh, 
one of the chief designers of the atomic bomb, he said you should have gotten the Nobel Peace Prize for developing that weapon because of the effect it had. So yes, it, it, it most certainly had an effect on preventing, preventing war, a very, 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 very scary effect and one that I, I, I would like to see go away. I would like to see us reducing our nuclear stockpiles. I would like to see countries giving up nuclear weapons. Uh, we seem to be going in the other direction again. Thank you. I have another question from Carl Schneider, uh, who also just followed up with a, uh, a comment that says he is reading Sapiens now, and it is a great book. Okay, other question. What comments do you have on the new quote-unquote peace that seems to be evolving in the Middle East under the current administration? Is America fulfilling its role, or is this current situation a flash in the pan? You know, we, we, we've always been deeply, in, well, not always, certainly throughout my career. And our, our engagement, our deep engagement in the Middle East really didn't begin, I think, until the Israeli War of 1967. That's when Americans sort of began to take more of an interest in the Middle East and what goes on there. Uh, and ever since, it has grown. So I, I don't use words like flash in the pan because every administration, every administration that I worked for, when they first came in and they were briefed on, on, on the Middle East said, oh, we're not gonna touch that. You know, there's no, there's, no, there's no future for peace in the Middle East. Let's not get involved. And every one of them has gotten involved. Some of them have come in saying, we're gonna solve it. We're gonna do it. We're gonna make peace in the Middle East. When I arrived in Cairo in August of 1993, and I was the political officer, uh, and my portfolio was Egypt's uh, external relationship with its Arab neighbors and with Israel. Uh, and in August of 93, there was, uh, uh, there was a, a, a couple of efforts going on, the multilateral talks that developed out of Madrid were still going on. Uh, and there was, as my ambassador, Robert Pelletro, a wonderful diplomat, as, as Ambassador Pelletro said to me in his office when I first arrived, he said, Tom, we're giving you this portfolio. Frankly, it's kind of moribund. There's not a whole lot going on. There's something going on up in Oslo, but we don't think it's going to amount to very much. And in September, uh, uh, Arafat and Rabin were shaking hands on the White House lawn with a beaming Bill Clinton, who never thought he was going to get involved in this. And here he is on the White House lawn with these two guys signing an agreement that we all thought, and my job over the next three years in Cairo was to, to report on the negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians that took place in Cairo and in Egypt largely. Um, and he got, they got deeply involved in it. And then Clinton stayed involved right up through the Y plantation. I'm, I'm, I know some of you may know this history. I, I, I know it intimately. Uh, when, when the agreement between uh, Arafat and, and um, the Israeli prime minister, whose name just dropped away, I see his face, the, uh, broke down as well. And he was disappointed in it. I think George Bush came in saying, you know, we're not, we're not going to make, this is not going to be the focus of my foreign policy. And yet uh, he ended up invading Iraq, partially because his, his advisors told him that this was the path to peace between Israel and the Arab countries. Uh, it's all, again, a long, complicated story. Uh, every administration has gotten wrapped up in it. When, when Obama came in, he said he's going to do it. Kerry, John Kerry, devoted half of his life to this, to try to make it work. So I think, you know, our current president tends to make grandiose statements about what he's going to do and what he's going to solve. Um, and I think that his efforts with the Palestinians and the Israelis have not amounted to very much. And I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to make that my chief criticism of him. Uh, a lot have failed before him. Uh, and what has happened here in that we're just talking about with Bahrain and the UAE and maybe with other countries is positive. It's progress. It's something. Peace in the Middle East is, is almost an oxymoron. And that's sad. 
especially for someone like me who came into the Middle East in, in, in 91 and left it in 2015. And it's hard to argue that it was a more peaceful place uh, when I left. Uh, it's it's a tough nut, and it's one I think that we're going to continue to try to crack, and we should do it. Um, it's not a flash in the pan. Uh, <laughs> sometimes I, we feel like we're in the pan. Um, it's going to continue to be an important issue for whoever is a, is it, it runs the next American administration. It's going to continue to be a big issue for them, whether they like it or not. Thank you. I have uh, two questions written by one of our in-person <coughs> attendees here who's handed it to me. Uh, I'll read them both to you. Number one, what is the future of Kurdistan? And number two, could you comment on the human rights issues in Bahrain in the 2011 to 2014 timeframe? Yes. Kurdistan. I love to tell stories, so, and, and why not? It's dinner time, I'll tell stories. When I was my second time into Iraq uh, in 2008, and this was during the so called uh, uh, military and civilian surge in Iraq, uh, we sent a whole lot more troops and a whole lot more civilians into Iraq to really, for, for a sort of an all, uh, an all out effort to try to uh, resolve the dozens of issues that confronted Iraq. One of them was the boundaries of Iraqi Kurdistan relative to the rest of Iraq. After 2003, the Kurds, who had a very credible and well-trained and well-armed fighting force, the Peshmerga, which means in Kurdish, the, those who confront death. You gotta love the drama. But the, the, Kurds, the, Kurds, the Kurds had been very effective. They had even come into the outskirts of Baghdad uh, during that war with the support, our support, and, and our, even our encouragement. Uh, the rest of the, uh, the Iraqi Arabs, once, once the, sort of the, 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 the war was over, uh, Iraqi Arabs were not happy about this and demanded that the Kurds go back to Kurdistan. So the question was, where the hell is Kurdistan? Where is that boundary? And I spent many, 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 many long hours with Kurdish leaders. There is a competition in the Middle East, and I'm being, I'm retired now, I can be less politically correct. There's a competition in the Middle East over who's the most oppressed people. You know, we Palestinians for yada, 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 we've never, you know, we've been oppressed and we've been pushed around and, and everybody you talk to at some point tells you their tale of injustice and oppression. And as a negotiator or a, a, you know, a diplomat working with these groups, it gets a little wearisome to, to go from one room with the Turk, the Turk men in it to the next room with the Christians, to the next room with the Arabs, to the next room with the Kurds. And they all first spend an hour telling you about how oppressed they are and how unjustly they've been treated. Well, the Kurds were the kings. They, they were the best at it. And with some reason. I mean, there's some history here. Uh, uh, the Kurds will tell you that they are the largest ethnic group in the world with their own language and their own culture for, for a thousand years. They are the only one who had never had their own state. They've never had their own country. They've been broken up among other countries. Uh, the Masoud Barzani, who I believe is still the prime minister of Kurdistan, I'm not sure. Uh, this old, but I met with Masoud, an old Peshmerga fighter many times, and he said to me in his perfect Arabic, because most Kurds do speak Arabic, some don't want to, but they do. Uh, he said, we Kurds have been cursed by God. He surrounded us with Arabs, Turks and Persians, and he put us on a lake of oil. And, you know, they demanded their rights. If you sat a hundred Kurds in any room at any time, and you asked them, do you want an independent Kurdistan? 99 of them would raise their hands and would jump to their feet. And the one who didn't was probably an Iranian spy. That was told to me by another Kurdish, Kurdish leader. 
I don't know how they get there. Certainly when I was there in 2008, we argued very strongly with Kurdish leadership, don't take that step. Don't move towards independence because you'll force us to make a choice between you and Baghdad and between you and Ankara and you won't like what we choose. Now we have abandoned the Kurds before. We just did again. Uh, I don't know what the future brings. I do know that Iraqi Kurdistan, which is largely in, I mean, it, it is very autonomous. They run their own affairs. They, they share the economy with Baghdad and they grouse about that all the time. Uh, they share the oil with Baghdad, which is the big part of the money earner, which they say. They have to deal with the Iranians, they have to deal with the Turks, and they have to deal with the Syrians as well. There is a great, great, great affinity among Kurds, even though they fought among themselves uh, in the recent past. This notion of being Kurdish not Arab, not Turkish, not Persian. Kurdish is very strong. I do think someday there will be an independent Kurdistan. Uh, I don't think it'll come peacefully. Thank you. I have a question from Salah. Well, I'm Dineen sorry. Hamoud. I'm sorry. I was asked about Bahrain as well. Do you want me to answer that? Oh, one I'm first? so sorry. Yes, you're I'll absolutely right. Go ahead. I'll be a little faster so folks can can have another glass of wine and head for home soon. The, the, uh, uh, in Bahrain, uh, when, when I went out in 2011, I mean, it was right after the Arab Spring, if you remember the so-called Arab Spring that began in Tunisia and spread to Egypt and Syria and Libya. It was very intense in Bahrain as well. Uh, the demonstrations uh, in the center of Manama, uh, the capital of Bahrain, uh, went on for many weeks uh, they were largely peaceful. Uh, there were confrontations with security. Uh, and and uh, eventually the government decided, probably because of Saudi insistence, but also because the Sunni minority, Bahrain is split pretty equally between the two major sects of Islam, Shia and Sunni. The Sunni are the, ruli, the rulers, the Khalifa family. It, they're by far the wealthier community and the more successful community. The Shia community is poorer. They have less influence and less power. Uh, they, they were, it was primarily a Shia demonstration, although there were some Sunni opposition as well engaged in it. Uh, it was eventually brutally uh, 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 repressed uh, by the by the government. Uh, they went into the square, uh, they beat a lot of folks, they arrested a lot of people, they threw a lot of people into jail, into prison, they tortured a lot of people, and they killed a few as well. Uh, the world was basically stunned. Barack Obama, for the first time, I think, in, in a presidential speech, actually talked about Bahrain. Bahrain is a tiny country. It's it's, it's, there, there, there's, there, there's only you know, 1.2 million people in it. You can walk across it in half a day. It's a little island connected to Saudi Arabia by a causeway. It's important to us because it's our largest Navy base in the region. And that is very important to us and to the Saudis that we have this base in Bahrain. So, so the Obama administration was appalled at the, uh, at the human rights, at the, at the, you know, at, at the, at the, brutal suppression of this peaceful demonstration. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, we very much didn't want to jeopardize what we considered to be a crucial security relationship uh, with, uh, with Bahrain. And Bahrain didn't want to either. Uh, when Obama criticized them, we cut off military aid. Uh, we demanded that they release prisoners. Uh, uh, we demanded that they hold fair and free elections. We made a lot of demands, as the United States is sometimes wont to do. Usually, it's not a particularly effective ploy to, to make demands of other countries regarding how they run their own affairs. But this is what we did. And I was sent out as ambassador to try to make both of these policies work. Uh, Hillary Clinton said it was like chewing. We can walk and chew gum, she said to me. We can do both of them. 
And I said, yeah, I can give it my best, but you know, sometimes you bite the inside of your lip, uh, inside of your cheek and it, it hurts like hell. And maybe we should just sit down and chew gum, you know, and, and then walk another, it, it, it was, it was difficult. The, 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 the human rights community rightly uh, was, was up in arms in uh, criticism of what the Bahraini government had done. Uh, and the military security intelligence community was also, you know, more quietly and discreetly up in arms with me about don't do anything that's going to jeopardize this very important relationship we have with them. Uh, we worked very hard with the government. I mentioned the crown prince, uh, educated at American University, sp speaks better English than I do, uh, is a very thoughtful and intelligent man. Uh, he recognized that they had to do something. They brought in international commissions. They, they tried to reform the police. They, they, they called for new elections, which were frankly not very well conducted. Uh, they did a whole lot of stuff, not necessarily at our insistence, but they did it because one, maybe they felt it was the right thing to do, but two, they felt they had to do it for the future of their country and their relationship with us and with other countries. It didn't really work out. We kept pushing and pushing and pushing. We made half fast efforts in human rights and political rights. Uh, in the end, um, I think we sort of gave up. I left. I was not very popular there, by the way. The, the government and the Sunni community thought I was the devil sent out to basically create an Iranian, uh, an Iranian led mullah government in Bahrain, which is weird. They claimed I was the head of an Israeli American Iranian conspiracy to overthrow the Bahraini government. Uh, I, I thought it, Israel, Iran, and America, good work. But it, it, was, it was a very difficult time for Bahrain and for us. Frankly, in the end, we made, I think, the Kissingerian decision, which is what is in the best interests of the United States of America first. And that was maintaining this security military relationship in a region in which we really needed to have a security and military presence. And that's where we are today. The heads of the opposition are all in jail serving life sentences. The parliament is a rubber stamp of the king uh, and the government. The Shia community is just as poor and depressed as it was uh, when I arrived there. Uh, and that's where it is. Sometimes it just doesn't all work. Thank you. Uh, the next question from Salah Tane Hamoud. Why isn't there such a keen interest in the current administration for working out a peace deal in Yemen, Syria, but so much enthusiasm to get the Gulf countries to sign deals with Israel? Well, because it was easy with the Gulf countries. I mean, hell, Dubai and, and the United Arab Emirates are among the most prosperous places in the world. I'm sure some of you have probably been to Dubai. Uh, it's, it's, it's an astonishing place. I lived there for four years, 97 to 2001. Uh, Bahrain is also a relatively, since 2011, you know, a peaceful place. Uh, it's all about business. Um, it's pretty easy, frankly. I'm, I'm sorry, nothing's easy in the Middle East. And I don't, I don't want to, 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 to sort of dismiss the efforts of this administration, of, of, of Jared Kushner and the negotiators who put this together. But God, compared to Yemen, compared to Syria, compared to Iraq, compared to uh, Lebanon, a piece of cake, I'm sorry. Yemen is a country that will always, <clears throat> always be in my heart. Uh, it was one of the most amazing places I have ever lived. Uh, the Yemeni people are just, uh, I just love them. Uh, and, and it was easy to do. Uh, one, as an Arabist, it's a place where the Arabic language is spoken almost in its purity. So that was really cool to be there. Uh, it was a country that really needed and wanted our help, and I wish we could have given more. I feel that we failed. What has happened in Yemen is not entirely our responsibility or, or our fault, but it has become one of the most desperate countries on earth. Uh, and I don't know the way out don't know what the answer is and I don't think 
there's anybody really in the administration or in the State Department that can sit down today and say, here's what we need to do, and that what we need to do is possible to do right now. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I think there are things we could have, we could do still that might affect the situation positively. One would be to work closer with the Saudis and the Emiratis in their efforts in Yemen, which have often been at odds. They've often bumped up against each other. Uh, it's impossible for us to work with Iran. Uh, and Iran has, is playing a big role with, in support of one of the major groups, the Al-Houthis in, in Yemen. And Yemen is a tribal society, much of it is anyway, where those family and tribal relationships uh, matter a great deal more than, than, you, than town councils and central governments matter. It did when I was there as well. And these are often impenetrable to outsiders. We, we, even the best diplomats, and I don't say I'm one, but even the folks who understand and get out there and work with them, uh, you, you have to understand your limitations when you're working with this kind of a tightly knit, insular, tribal society. Uh, I, I don't, I don't um, I criticize this current administration for failures in Yemen. I think we can do more, but I don't really know what the answer is. Uh, in Syria, uh, what I worry about with Syria and Libya and Lebanon, countries that are really in turmoil and, and, and on the brink, uh, is that we've kind of just abnegated any role internationally or regionally. We've kind of left it to the Russians and the Chinese, to the Syrians themselves, to Iran, which has enormous influence in Syria and in Lebanon. Uh, we don't seem to be engaged in these places. Admittedly, they're really hard and our engagement has not always been positive and we've, we've taken some real hits in these countries. In Libya, you know, I lost one of my best friends in the Foreign Service uh, a few years ago when Chris Stevens was assassinated in, in Benghazi. Uh, in Syria, you know, we, we engaged with Syria. When, when James A. Baker was Secretary of State, I think he lived in Damascus at one point trying to solve it. <sighs> I, again, I, I, I don't, we can't give up on the Middle East. We're not going to be allowed to, but I don't fault the Trump administration for failures in the Middle East. Thank you. I have a question from Pavel Kozetnikov. So in choosing between security and democracy, we have to choose security. I think that's referring to an earlier uh, question you were answering. Not always, not always. And uh, sometimes we can have both and we should pursue both. It, it is, as, a, as an American diplomat overseas for 36 years, always in our sort of our toolbox, our, our, our sort of set of values, uh, our, our assignments was the promotion of democratic ideals, of an open society, of a free society, of, of, of free uh, and independent media, of an independent judiciary, of those organizations that, that I believe and that we as Americans believe are the core of, of our success and that could be part of other countries' successes too. Our mistake is sometimes we try to overload them with the whole thing uh, at once and sometimes we go in pounding the table and making demands. Countries, independent countries don't like to be lectured to, they don't like to have demands, they don't like to have, be threatened, even when it's not in, in when, when, when it's against their best interests, they will resist and reject that kind of a, an approach. So when we're out there building democracy, we have to take a look at, 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 at the particular place, what it, what it wants and what it needs and what's possible. And then the second part of every mission I've ever been on has been to establish and maintain 
the security of the United States and the American people through a web of international organizations, through and through military alliances, through intelligence gathering and sharing something we don't talk about very much and rightly so, but we have in that, that network of intelligence agencies around the world who work with us is extraordinarily important to our security. So the question is, let's go back to Bahrain. I mean, should we have simply pulled our Navy out and said, we're not gonna, we're not gonna have our Navy in a country that's abusing its citizens, uh, a democratic and human rights? Should we break off all relations with them? I'm a diplomat, first of all, and I do not believe you should break relations off ever. I think, I think the, the diploma, breaking the diplomatic relations with Iran as, 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 as acute and desperate as that situation was, was a mistake. We had diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union during the most dangerous times in the Cold War. We never threw the Russian ambassador out of Washington. It probably prevented uh, World War III or, or prevented a nuclear war uh, uh, in October of 1963 in the Cuban Missile Crisis, having that Russian ambassador there. I'm, I'm going off point here, but you know, you, you try to balance this, you try to balance it. And again, Clinton told me you can do both. Sometimes you can't. You don't have to make that stark decision, but what's in the best interests of the United States of America? That's really what you make your decision on. Uh, sometimes that's a hard decision, but it's a hard world sometimes. Thank you. Um, I have a question. You began your remarks talking about the role of the State Department and um, the downsizing in influence and size. Um, can you comment on the respective roles of the National Security Council and the State Department and how they have grown and changed over the past few years? Yeah. Yes, yes, I can. I, I mean, in, in, my, in my experience, and again, I spent most of my time overseas in embassies, and you really get a different perspective on American policy when first you're, you're taking a much smaller piece of it, and you're out on the ground trying to make it work. I, again, I always liked that more, but, and you had a different perspective, and you weren't always as engaged with what was going on in Washington, and all of the, the, the infinite meetings and discussions and uh, debates that take place in Congress, in the NSC administration, State Department, in the interagency process. Uh, uh, so that's, you know, I preferred it. When I was, but I had to go back to Washington a couple of times. Twice I went back as sort of a political officer. One is the India, uh, the political officer, desk officer for India in 1988 to 1990. And again, as the deputy director and then the director of the Iraq desk in 2001 to 2004. And both of those times I had to engage with the NSC. And then as an ambassador in both Yemen, more so in Bahrain, uh, you also engage with the NSC. Uh, and in, those in that time, I've noticed an, an incredible expansion in the size of the NSC in the size of their departments, their offices that dealt with the, either the global issues or the regional issues that the State Department and other agencies also dealt with. Traditionally, its role was to gather together representatives from the Pentagon, from CIA, from State Department, uh, and from you know, whatever other concerned agencies, bring them over usually over to the old executive office building and have a discussion of uh, the Arab Spring, what's going on, whatever the issue might be, led by the senior NSC uh, officer who would then report to the National Security Advisor, who then presumably would report to the president and make recommendations. That's the way it was supposed to work and the way it still does. It's just that it's gotten a lot larger. Every secretary of state Every president who has come in has also had, uh, and you know, this is this is an understandable wariness, even suspicion, about 
the government. Some of them come in, like Ronald Reagan in 1981, you know, I'm gonna clean Washington up. Well, we've been trying to clean Washington for a while now. Actually, it's not that dirty a place, I have to say. But, you know, we, we would, they and they come in, and, and so they're immediately, they don't want to be, and I remember James A. Baker telling one of my bosses, I was, I was only in the, a middle-ranked officer then, but I worked for Baker for a while. Um, but he, uh, he said, I'm not going to be seduced by the Foreign Service. So, he, you know, so they tend to bring in some of their own people um, uh, and put them in positions, usually at the NSC, as sort of their eyes and ears on what the State Department is doing and what Pentagon is doing and what CIA is doing. And they tend to rely a bit more on these people uh, for advice. Again, it, it, there's some justification here. I have found that the, that the really good secretaries of state, and I put Baker near the top of the list of the people who, who you know, I was under, uh, they quickly, and Baker was expert at this, recognized where the talent is, where the advantage is, where the strengths of the State Department were, and he exploited us. And he did it really brilliantly uh, uh, throughout his tenure. Um, uh, uh, I think uh, Hillary Clinton was also very good at this too. Whatever criticisms may be of her and other things, she was quite good. Uh, Colin Powell was every Foreign Service officer's favorite Secretary of State because uh, he treated us with such respect, mostly. Uh, but I think presidents over the year, they've grown this NSC as, as kind of a way to buffer uh, the White House from these government agencies. I mean, I would argue it's too large. I would argue that more, more uh, reliance should be placed on state, but that's my perspective. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I think that the current president has taken this somewhat uh, 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 farther down. He's pushed this envelope out a bit more as far as his distrust of the government. He's quite open about it. His distrust of the State Department in particular. Um, I don't think that's particularly wise, but there it is. And the NSC, again, is the president's the president's State Department, the president's uh, Office of, Inter of International Affairs in the Pentagon, the president's CIA, it's kind of his, his group. So there we have it. Now, it's a fact of life in Washington and it's frankly one of the reasons why, again, I, I liked being at embassies better. Thank you. I, Unless we have another question, this is the last call for questions. Are there not? Okay, wait, we do have one coming up right now. Just a second. Thank you. I'm going to try um, to um, capitalize on your broad thinking that you implied you had at the beginning, rather than specific State Department or NSC type of questions. You referred to the climate change and also the fresh water challenge that we had as big problems. And instead of just going to war over water resources or uh, some aspect of climate change, I would like to broaden that and ask for your insights about how we can make it more effective in terms of taking f Defense Department dollars, maybe just the incremental dollars that go to the Defense Department and put them into the State Department, put them towards the foreign aid so that we build more water desalination plants. In other words, we do things to solve the water problem. Um, gray water, how do we recycle gray water, get hydrogen used, take the water out of the hydrogen, and also nuclear, nuclear plants. So could you comment on after January 22nd, we have a more outward looking department in Washington DC instead of inward. What, what can we look forward to to improve the chances that we avoid World War III by taking care of the water and the climate needs? Right, right. Um, I, part of my comments is, is, is of course heavily influenced by my long experience in the Middle East, which has 
been subject to uh, uh, severe water shortages pretty much uh, if modern history. Whether you were in Cairo and working on Nile issues or in Jordan and Palestine and Israel, uh, working on water sharing, sharing a very scarce resource. Uh, there are many other places in the world and, and I do think that fresh water as a resource uh, uh, is a likely cause of, of regional wars. I'm not sure about a world war. The way to go at it, and you, let me talk to your first point in which you suggested that money be uh, diverted from the uh, military budget to State Department, USAID, other other projects that might focus on this particular issue. And I agree with you 100%. And I, I know many leaders in the Pentagon, and I mentioned this previously, who would also agree with you that uh, the Department of Defense is not the best place to, 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 to lead these efforts. But they have a very large uh, civil affairs uh, a branch within, I think all of the military branches have a civil affairs group. They all have a foreign affairs group called the uh, foreign affair, the FAOs, the FAOs, the foreign affairs officers. They also have development officers. I, when I was in Yemen, uh, uh, at that time, Yemen was under the, uh, uh, was, was under sent under, uh, um, CENTCOM and CENTCOM had a base in the Horn of Africa in, uh, in Djibouti. And it was a naval base primarily, a naval installation. But they had the, the, the admiral in, in Djibouti had a great, had access to all of these civil defense funds. They, I think they were called the 1400 funds because of the, of the, uh, the clause in the, in the, in the regulations that, that, designated these funds for the military's use in civil affairs, in building, uh, in digging wells and building desal plants and exactly what you're talking about. Uh, and it was the military that would do it. Um, I had access to a lot of those assets when I was in Yemen and the Admiral there believed it would be very effective to do this in Yemen, but his civil affairs teams were tiny. I had a USAID mission in Yemen whose budget was being cut every year. Uh, my State Department budget was being cut. Our assistance budget in general was being cut. And this admiral said, look, tell me what you need and we'll get it done. And we did, we did quite a bit. Uh, at one point, both in Yemen and again in um, uh, Iraq, uh, we were able to access these 1,400 funds directly. Uh, and the, the, the uh, Undersecretary of Defense at the time was very supportive of this program to take these funds that had been designated to the Pentagon and basically redirect them to USAID, State Department, uh, Department of Agriculture, other agencies that could do this kind of development, civil service work, civil, uh, civil affairs work um, uh, in Yemen and elsewhere. Uh, we did this for a number of years, competing very, uh, ambassadors would compete for this money, you know, and whether you're in Lebanon or Yemen or Bolivia or wherever you happen to be, you had to make a proposal to the Pentagon to try to get some of these many millions, it was hundreds of millions of dollars. The Pentagon is not underfunded. Um, when Congress got a hold of this, they went ballistic. Uh, they, they, they demanded that the Pentagon stop, that the Pentagon did not have the authority to redirect these funds to other agencies, uh, that that was the Congress's job. And if the Congress wanted to fund USAID and State Department more, they would do it. And it was, it was a hard and, and rather stupid decision, but there it was. Uh, the, the, the key is to persuade the Congress to, to spread this money around a bit more to, to increase not just the money, but to increase the capacity to do this and to not make the military do it. The military doesn't really want to do it. Uh, in Iraq, when I was there in 2008, this, there was this huge effort 
to have a U.S. government presence in Iraq that was not in uniform. We do not want to be, you know, the military would say, we do not want to be the representatives of the United States abroad. Uh, that's not the America we want Iraqis to see. We want them to see the civilians. We want them to see our economic, our commercial, and our developmental strength, you know, I had Marine colonels in Iraq when I first went out there come into my office saying, I'm negotiating, a Marine captain rather, in the field negotiating an election agreement in a local town in Iraq. And he basically said, WTF, why am I doing this? Why aren't you doing it? And I said, because I'm the only one here right now. And I'll go out to Bakuba with you tonight, which, which I did. And I'll work with these guys for a day, but I got to come back to Baghdad tomorrow because I got to go down to Basra the day after that. There's only eight or 10 of us in the whole country. You know, there are tens of thousands of you. And we, 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 we somehow need to come to grips with the military certainly wants to do it. You know? <laughs> but uh, Congress, it's an easy sell for that senator or congressman from Kansas or from Iowa or from Massachusetts who's got military bases you know, in his district, who's got factories producing weaponry, equipment for uh, the military, who has constituents, who have boys and girls, you know, brothers, sisters, mothers, father, in the military. It's easy for him to, to support the military. It's really hard to support foreign aid or diplomacy. He can't, he can't sell that. Thank you. Okay. Ambassador, thank you so much for the wonderful program that you've given us and for being patient enough to answer all of our questions. It was wonderful, I think, for all of us. So please join me in thanking Ambassador Krajewski. Thank you all. Thank you very much, all of you out there, for being engaged, for caring about these issues, and for spreading that care and uh, your information around the community. It's, it's, it's very important. And I hope next year, I can come to Colorado Springs. <laughs> really, I need to get out of Falls Church. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank all of you. Let all me right. just uh, uh, announce too, our next speaker series webinar is October 1st with former Director of National Intelligence, Lieutenant General James Clapper. His program is entitled Threats to National Security and What the Intelligence Community Needs. Also on October 20th, we will be hosting former U.S. Special Representative for Ukraine negotiations and former U.S. Ambassador to NATO, Kurt Volker, for his program, Building the Post-Election, Post-COVID World. So please uh, go to our website to register for those programs. And for any information on our other programs, um, please visit our website at csworldaffairs.org. Well, thank you, and I will see you October 1st. Good night. Good night. Wait before you waste, waste some fun of time. It's so bad.